Hi, everybody. Welcome back to my channel. Shout out to everybody in the chat. Let me see. Let these notifications go out and hit the notification train. Welcome, everybody. Thank you guys for being here. Shout out to everybody in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hold up, y'all. Let me check my other device. We're going to hit the ground running because we got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, this whole series, my thoughts, first part, and I was actually able to get some clips, okay? So let me start by saying a couple things. First of all, for those that are wondering, hold up, y'all. Everybody see me, let me know. Shout out to everybody. Thank you for being here. I have a survey on the poll in the chat. Let me know if you've watched the series or if you're refusing to watch it because you're waiting for me to review it. Let me know your thoughts, okay? In that poll, please let me know your thoughts in the chat. Absolutely. A couple things I want to start with is, um, let's start with the series. Let's just go ahead and hit the ground running with that. Mm. The series is Yolanda's family up in front center, really giving some details in terms of their ex experience, their thoughts, their judgment, where they're at. So this is really, um, it's Yolanda Saldivar being interviewed, but it's also family of the Saldivar that is also speaking out. So that is interesting to me, right? Keep that in mind. Um, was there anything new information as far as so far in episode one? Not really. Uh, and, and let me, I might change my mind on that because maybe the only thing that I realized was new was one of the family members. I didn't know this, but one of the family members by the name of Tina Armillo, which we'll see here pretty shortly, was actually one of the boutique managers. I had no idea that there was, uh, that the family was, there was additional family members working with Selena. So that was new to me. But as far as new information that would make me change my mind so far, no. Um, episode one, they didn't address Yolanda's allegations of rape. Because if you remember, she alleged that Abraham Quintanilla Selena's father had raped her. She No allegations of that. There was a new, like story or like what happened at the very beginning when she was being interrogated. We want to talk about that and more contradiction that I picked up on. So I was able to get this at least main points condensed from the series. So the series overall is about two hours, two hours. Okay. And I will say it, it was interesting to have like the professionals, Larry, uh, uh, Detective Rivera or, or, you know, Officer Rivera, as well as other folks that were in that circle participate in this interview. What the series really try to do is present two sides of the coin. Not the best way, but it, I'll give them that. They try, okay? They also try to change motive. That's the whole point of this series, motive. It was an accident. That is what they're trying to portray. So let's go ahead and get started with this little review. Like I said, I condensed it two hours into 30 minutes, taking out certain commercials, and I'm going to give commentary under fair use. Uh, a narrative that is not correct, that I was an embezzler, that I was an obsessed fan. My right as a, as a citizen of the United States to be innocent and to proven guilty was reversed on me. I was guilty and needed to prove my, my innocence. So let me stop right here. And just so you guys know, I have to transform the content um, in order for it to be fair use. This is why it's completely transformed in my screen. You guys can see it. It allows me to do content without getting dinged by YouTube and stuff like that. So the series starts by Yolanda saying that um, A.B., Abraham, not A.B., Abraham Quintanilla Sr. poisoned the media, that this was an accident that she was not embezzling anybody, okay? This is what she has started with. I know that they loved her, no doubt. And I know that the people to this day still hurt for her. I do too. And I think that Abraham took advantage of that sediment, that sympathy, and used it for his benefit. To this is an important part that she points out. She says, Abraham used it, used the love that, that people had for Selena to his advantage. 
to paint a narrative. When Selena died, Abram was one of the first to do a press release. He did a press release on his own. Now, he was Selena's music manager. So I really don't see why that would be an issue. Essentially, within the hours that Selena died, um, he let everybody know that who had killed her. And as far as what they knew so far, that's what he did. Now, the problem with this situation is that while he's having this press release, my understanding, based on how the series is pointing this out, is that Yolanda was still in the car with the uh, in the truck, in the pickup truck with this uh, gun on her forehead. Poisoned their minds and continues to do that. My family was devastated from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. My parents had had all my belongings, they had all my property, they had all my files, they had everything. And they, for months, put it all together. My sister, my brothers, and my parents said, we're gonna vow to tell the truth, but you have to tell us the whole truth, no matter who it hurts. We have to get justice for you. We cannot let lies and untruths stand. And my mom would always tell me, a lie will stand until the truth arrives. She said, we have to get justice for you. They have to get justice for Yolanda because the truth, the truth is out there. Let's be very clear. If this was an accident, if the DA had went through this as an accident, the conviction would not have been the same. It is very important for them to have painted this out as an accident in order for Yolanda to have either had a reduced sentence or a different kind of sentence. Okay. The DA felt like, no, this was black and white, a very, what it was, a murder case. That's what it was. So here we are 29 years later after the fact. Okay. She's up for parole next year. And they're wanting to inform the public about what Yolanda, you know, what, what was the truth of the matter? What That's what this is about, okay? through the family version through the documentation that Yolanda has in her possession. I think in this case particularly, they mean to. This lady right here, by the way, her name is Tina Armillo. Tina Armillo, this is what I, this was new to me. Tina Armillo was actually, I guess, a worked at the one of Selena's boutiques and uh, she was close Tina Armillo is related to the Saldivar family, okay? Different last name, but she's related. She's a niece. And the reason I say that is because I know the relationship between Selena and Yolanda. I was there from the beginning of their relationship. But yet, nobody really knows who I am. The public only knows what they've been told, right? Mm. There's been a story that has been created, but nobody really knows exactly what happened and what's in these boxes tells that true story about what happened it's just interesting that it's been living in this storage and in, in you know in these boxes for almost you know 25 plus years so they've had all this information living in the storage in these boxes it's been in storage is what she says my name is tina i was the san antonio selena etc boutique manager selena was my friend I am also Yolanda Saldivar's niece. Not very many people know that I am Yolanda Saldivar's niece. Mm. So because I don't share the same last name with Yolanda, I have friends to today that don't know that I am related to Yolanda Saldivar. So if you guys were in that position where you're Yolanda Saldivar's niece, would you tell people that y'all were related? I mean, if it was a truth that you felt could exonerate a family member, would you tell people that you're related to possibly the most hated woman in america in the latino community i mean definitely in the latino community she is the most hated woman in the latino community this is my first time that i've ever been on really on camera to to say my truths mm. i don't feel comfortable coming forward now but i feel that it's a necessity at this point yolanda has spent nearly 29 years in prison um and in one year can be eligible for parole interesting in these boxes there is a story of selena and yolanda's relationship as a family we are putting together the pieces of this puzzle 
so that we can show the public that there is more to the story than what they have been told. And she decided to start the thing for it. All right, so let me stop right here. So she basically uploads these boxes, and in these boxes, they're going to do like a family table thing where they go through this evidence and the camera is panning to them as they're reviewing this evidence okay um it starts here by saying how the narrative is pointed or it's said through their words that saldivar the saldivar family was helping selena or helped selena through the fan club Th that this was a family thing that they did where they were helping the quintanilla family which i thought was interesting i was like maybe that's how it went down i don't know yes. At the beginning of the fan club, as a family, we all helped out. These are all great times, you know, the fan club, the shirts, remember the pencils, the, I remember the house is being cluttered with Selena stuff. The Saldivar family, they did a lot for Selena. We'd always spend a lot of times at the Saldivar uh, ranch having dinner and we would uh, put all these packages together for the fan club. We were doing it for Selena because, of course, Selena didn't have nobody else to do it. Selena didn't have anybody else to do it to help her with the fan club. And this was around the time in the early 91, 92, when her, her fame, she was really starting to hit and get uh, gather some fame and people knew her. Um, at the end of the day, Selena was very local to Corpus Christi. Selena had a house and her parents lived in the other house. I mean, they literally had houses right next to each other. And you would think it would have been like a McMansion. No, it was a regular schmegular type of house, you know, which is kind of nice that, I mean, that Selena could have been anybody's neighbor. She was, she had neighbors. That's where the relationship started. And then that evolved, that evolved into a friendship. Yolanda accompanied Selena for the filming of one of her videos. And so I think even the family to a point depended on Yolanda to be her chaperone. This is interesting because the, the video that they're talking about was she went to go do the video for uh, Bidi Bidi Bam Bam. Around that time, I believe Selena was already 21. So she needed people to accompany her. Like this, is, you know, I don't know. Maybe it was a different time. Maybe there was, because it's the music industry as a woman, as a, you know, uh, Latina woman, you have to have people accompany you to, you know, uh, events. But this one I felt kind of odd. I said, well, she was, she was also married. Couldn't her husband accompany her? You know, I'm just thinking out loud of the way in which the information was being delivered here. Well, I, I was running the fan club. And one day um, in July of 94, I believe, um, Abraham called me and said, Yolanda, you, we, we would like for you to, to see if you can go with Selena go, to go to L.A., because she's going to be filming uh, Bitty Bitty Bomb Bomb, but none of us can go with her. Somebody has to go with her. And uh, so I went. That's when the friendship started solidifying very, very close. We did a bunch of things. We'd go to the park. We would go to the movies and uh, just hang out. And we'd go to the clubs. And she loved that. She just wanted someone that she could depend on. And she knew I was there to do her work. Like they talk about like she was obsessed and yada yada but to me this just like shows they were really good friends you know what i mean like beyond just being a friend and an employee she became her companion and her confidant this is interesting so then the family in this next scene tries to talk about how this narrative of an obsessed fan We've heard, I've heard that time and time, I, and I've said it too, um, that there was an obsession. She was an obsessed fan, whereas the family standing here showing pictures and saying, what an obsessed fan, th this is a friend. This is a friend. Of, this is not an obsessed fan. She became a confidant. She became somebody that Selena could talk to, which would make sense if, you know, if she's traveling with you, if you're connecting with each other, y'all are, you know, in the same stuff. Like that would make sense that, she would become a friend, but they're trying to dispel this narrative that she was an obsessed fan, which I was like, okay, can your friend, your confidant also be obsessed with you? Yeah, you'd have it both ways, you know? Yolanda was protecting some of Selena's secrets and not just some secrets that maybe the family didn't want out, but secrets from the family. Yes, and thank you, Justine. You know, uh, she was a fan, though. She started as a fan. 
um, she was going to the concerts. Whether she liked the music or not, that's she contacted the family to be to start the fan base because the Saldiva family as a whole liked the music, right? So she just became dependable, like you know, to Selena. And so I think with that dependency came, you know, them even getting closer. They were best buds. They were pals. They did everything. They went to the mall together. They went shopping together. You like it. And this is one of the DAs, by the way, that is also interviewing in the series. His nickname was Buffy. The word Buffy is something that, like, in our little group, Selena, Suzette, me, some girls that we met through, just through them, that became our friends. Mm -hmm. Like, we would always call each other Buffy. Like, hey, Buffy. They just like, hey, buddy. Like, hey, yeah. friend. You knew you were Selena's friend when she be started calling you Buffy. You were part of her inner circle. Things like a lot of those big... So let me stop right there. Um, and they established the fact that there are some voicemails out there that the Saliva family has where Selena is leaving voicemails calling her Buffy. So this this narrative of Buffy is is very important for the family. Buffy, like Buffy the vampire, not Duffy. Buffy. Like kind of like bestie, buddy, but Buffy. Um, Buffy the vampire slayer, kind of like that. Welcome everybody. Thank you guys for coming in. And let me shout out Jen, Hoffa, Gail, and Brown Eyed uh girl. Thank you for becoming a member, guys. Thank you guys. You guys are awesome. Thank you for supporting the channel. Um, yeah, so that was important. Now they bring in this reporter by the name of, I forgot, her, I wrote it down. Her name is Kat, but I can't remember her last name. What the heck was her last name? I'll remember it later. So Kat is a journalist. I believe she's a local journalist for that area. And Kat brings a very interesting point, which Kat Cardenas, that's her name. Kat Cardenas brings in a very interesting point. I wrote some notes. And basically, she talks about the fact that in the 90s, the tabloids were so unforgiving about women, Latino women specifically. I mean, I think that the tabloids have always been very unforgiving of folks. Even now, I think it's gotten worse. Um, and then at this point, anybody can become a tabloid, too. So keep that in mind. But she talked about just the way in which Yolanda was painted. She was this 30-year-old woman, didn't have children, wasn't married. Versus you have uh, Selena, who was married, 23. So kind of the, the tabloids painted Yolanda as this villain. That's what Kat is basically letting us know, that the narrative was going out there. And so then for us, especially the older generation, I mean, I'm a millennial. But if for those uh, Gen X's and those before that remember the Selena narrative, you remember specifically the narrative putting out there that Yolanda was an obsessed fan. So Kat kind of goes in here and talks about the fact that there's probably more to the story that folks don't want to consume. Kat, in my opinion, pulls in the Maria Celeste Arras, the reporter who basically decides to give the other side. Um, but to, to, I don't know if it's a, a way in which to excuse the murder. That's the piece that I don't understand. And maybe in part two, I'll get it a little bit different. Responsibilities to Yolanda does speak to how close they are. Absolutely, it does. It went from being the president to being friends and then growing that relationship where there was trust enough that Selena was like, okay, you know, you did a good job with the fan club. Um, I really do trust you. And so I'm having issues with my business. So please help me with my business. When she started working for Selena, shortly after that, um, Yolanda did resign as the president of the Selena fan club. When I interviewed Selena mm. for Texas Monthly Magazine, I had to pull stuff out of her to talk about her music career. She wanted to talk about her fashion design and her boutiques. Selena's dream was not to be the next Madonna. I think she would have been happy to achieve that kind of success. She was that success oriented and driven. But so this is an important part because, um, and, and I've seen this guy be interviewed, I forgot his name, but I've seen him be interviewed in various um, uh, places where he talks about Selena. You know, Selena, he talks, he gives, he basically says that Selena was more passionate about her fashion designs than she was about the music. And her father has kind of opened up and said, I was more focused on the music. You know, Selena had her, her business and her boutique and everything, but he was more focused on the business side. 
So it gives us that idea of like Abraham, if there was any control to exert, it was probably from the music side, where Selena, being the creative, she was able to control the creative side of her clothing line, her her style of, of clothes. Shamina, thank you for becoming a member. Perry, and to answer this, the Mexican tabloids are probably 10 times worse than the American ones. Uh, I, honestly, 10 times worse. But her dream was the one thing that she had that was her own, Selena, et cetera. Right now, there are fixing to restand the floors. These are the original wooden floors that were in the home. It's a 1940 home. Her clothes are fundamentally something that is her idea, her expression, her way to be 100% herself on stage. Selena has this opportunity to kind of stake her own claim and have something that is just hers, and that's what she wants to be, Selena, etc. A clothing salon, a clothing line, a place that women could come and get their hair and nails done and look beautiful. The manicure stations, you can see them right here, um, where they're going to be doing nails. It was going to be Selena's line, Selena's name. You could go to the Selena, etc. boutiques in San Antonio or Corpus and get into Selena's world on her terms. Her father, Abraham, was not her boutique manager. He didn't, he didn't help her out on boutiques. That was her deal. This was interesting. The man, the dad didn't help. I mean, he didn't really have a medal in that business, right? He was more about the music and lunar yeah i wasn't this that was new to me i didn't know that there were additional family members that worked for the boutique that's probably the only thing that i would say so far that is new information to me as, as far as the series i didn't know that and the fashion thing was her deal there was a time where abraham told selena you either gonna have to choose between your business or your singing career now, this is what she's alleging, that there was a time that Abraham Quintanilla told Selena, you're going to have to choose between one or the other. And and she said, I can do both. I can do both. You don't own me. She was on the road to success for her fashion design and her perfume design. She knew it, and he knew it, too. He was mad that she did not incorporate him into her businesses at all. Mm. Interesting. My role at Selena, et cetera, was to be the senior training manager. Now, let me stop right here. Keep in mind that Abraham Quintanilla said when I translated that interview, and make sure I have a whole playlist in the description box where I'm translating the first interviews from uh, Spanish to English. You guys can check those out. It's in the description box. Keep in mind, remember when Abraham Quintanilla said when the reporter was asking her, hey, um, Asking him, hey, what, what were some of the regrets that you had as far as your daughter? Abraham said that he regretted the fact that he couldn't support, he didn't support Selena enough. Like maybe if he had supported Selena enough in the in the boutique, things would have been different. He said that. Meeting Selena the first time. I didn't feel like you were meeting like some big star that you feel so intimidated. Selena was like really down to earth. When I'm not performing or I don't have to do special TV things, I like to be like this, relaxed, just like anybody else. <laughs> she made it easy for people to talk to her. We became friends. It wasn't like she was like a superstar to me. We go shopping, we went to the malls, we go out to eat. It was just fun girl stuff. Selena had these goals to do fashion in her boutiques. And the enabler, her helper that made this possible, was Yolanda. This is interesting. They labeled her as an enabler. What was Yolanda like? If Yolanda was positioned in a in a situation where she is like the trustful person, the go between, the one that travels with Selena, what was she enabling exactly? And and I'm having a really hard time with the word enabling when Selena is over the age of 21 at this point. You know what I'm saying? Like unless everybody was treating Selena like a child. Then I'm like, well, damn, like, come on now. Enabling what? Yolanda, I mean, she was kind of our direct supervisor. Selena felt very comfortable and trusted Yolanda now to the boutique here in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. It's a little eerie. So here's the deal. It trusted, it, this is uh, Tina saying, trusted her enough, you know, to say things to her, to do, you know, to have her around for different things. In the series, they actually traveled to Selena, et cetera, the initial boutique, right? 
they go to the boutique and she's walking through these halls and she's like, oh my God, this, this place looks just, just so eerie, right? Of what it once was. They once were there. And it made me wonder, I wonder what the other employees that were there would think at this point. I'm kind of curious. And says, enabling her to be free of her father's control. Potentially, you know, because she wasn't really, you know, maybe Yolanda was playing both sides, right? I'm just thinking out loud. Um, any advice on how to watch the series? Um, there's another app that you can use called Fobu. Fobu, and I'll I'll link it in the um uh, in the community wall or the description box when I'm done today, okay? Um, so you guys can watch part two. You can sign up for like a free membership. It's also going to be available on Peacock. Uh, yes. Uh, let me see. I would think so, Ginger O'Snap. I didn't know Yolanda was so close in age. I thought she was some 45. No, she was in her 30s. Possibly, possibly trouble. She was in her 30s. Let me see what y'all are saying. Leah, thank you. Thank you, Mandy, for being here. Thank you. Cape says, Rabbit, what the father meant was if he was first, if he was involved with Selena's business, he would have caught the ceiling Yolanda was doing before it got severe. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yes, Richard, thank you for saying that. I was I was sitting there and I was waiting for it. Two this thing was two hours long. And I watched it three times. So y'all hit the like button because I wasted I was like six hours in this thing, writing notes, downloading, editing, doing different things for you guys. Look, I was waiting for them to talk about the rape. For that, like that would have been the that should have been the first thing on the episode. So is it gonna be this, uh, on the second episode? That's what I want to know. The people want to know. Because that's what she said. I don't know. I haven't stepped foot into this building for like over 20 years. This was our main boutique area. That was my office. Looks very different. Just all the hard work we put into this place. Mm. Like all the sweat and tears and I mean, <laughs> that we just banging our heads together to make sure that this was successful. Selena and Yolanda, the ending of that relationship, it has um, overshadowed some of the precious, beautiful times that we had together. Tina, it wasn't the ending of that relationship. It was the murder of Selena that is overshadowed. Like, okay, it wasn't the ending. It was the murder. And like, not just... Not times of Selena as Selena the singer, but just like Selena, my friend. Mm. I know me, me, me talking and sharing my truths is going to create a backlash in my personal life. Let me stop right here, and I kind of wonder, um, did did. Tina, or did anybody else notice anything? Did they ever feel like, you know, um, if you're if Selena is your boss, are you getting too close to your boss? Were there good boundaries? Did anybody else call this out? I just want to know. I want to know. With people now associating me with my aunt, which I feel conflicted because she is my aunt. I can't tell you that I don't love her because I do because she's a part of my of my family it's hard reliving it all over again mm. knowing that the end result is that i've lost two important people in my life the yolanda of it all it complicates things because of what yolanda did no one now can have a neutral perspective on who yolanda is because of what happened i would have to agree with her on that to me, there is no neutrality when it comes to life and death. Uh, are there people that are wrongfully convicted? Absolutely. But this isn't the case here. I'm just going to say that. It just isn't. It's. I can understand that people cannot be neutral when it comes to Yolanda. Hell, I'll even own that, right? But there is no neutrality when it comes to life and death. That's how I see it. Selena's not here to speak her part, right? That's just my thought. 
I don't know. We know that Yolanda killed Selena. Why Yolanda killed Selena? Mm. They were close friends. They were working together. What was the motive? After 20 years, that's my question. What Why was the Yolanda motive? Kills? Sometimes you can go back as far. Okay. So then this other journalist who is local to that area, um, she talks about, she questions the motive. What was the motive? So then the, the DA, they interview the DA, Carlos Valdez, as well as the other DA and the detectives to talk about motive. And they start kind of digging into paperwork and all that other stuff to paint motive, which is what you're supposed to do, right? But I kind of, and this is where I have to drag these professionals a little bit. I wish they would have been a little bit more ready because some of the questions that they're asking are valid questions. And we'll talk about those in a minute. But I did side eye Carlos. I did side eye the police work to a certain degree because there is some. If this is such an open and shut case, nobody should be questioning anything. There should be no conspiracy theories of anything. That's how I see it. Now, are there going to be people out there that have conspiracy theories? That's fine. There will be. But should there be when it's a murder case? That's the question. Two or three years before. In this case, against Yolanda Saldivar, we only went back a few months. Okay, here we go. January of 1995, Mr. Quintanilla, Selena's father, started getting phone calls from members of the fan club who said that they weren't getting what they were paying for. This is important. Yolanda Saldivar, she was the fan club president. So Mr. Quintanilla, who was always into promoting Selena in the band, would go to her and say, hey, why am I getting these calls? But, oh, they're just... They're lying, Mr. Quintanilla. They're just saying they didn't want to get a free membership. They want to get a free picture, a free poster, and stuff like that. But it kept happening. He, he kept getting phone calls and letters. He knew something was fishy. During the investigation into the books of the boutiques. We now, this is interesting. They're talking about the fan club, right? And then they go into the investigations of the books of the boutiques, okay? We found a lot of checks that were made by Yolanda Saldivar, to Yolanda Saldivar, signed by Yolanda. And not just one check, two checks, there were thousands of dollars of checks deposited in her account. Abraham and Selena's sister, Suzette, thought something should be done, I guess. And then they bring Selena in. I think Selena was the last one to be convinced. On the evening of March 9th, Mr. Quintanilla called a meeting with Yolanda Saldivar. Important date. Yolanda, this is uh, Abraham. Uh, you were supposed to be here at 9 o'clock at 9.20. We want to know what's happening. We need to talk to you. Call the office. So that's Abraham calling Yolanda for that meeting that everybody talks about, like, they were going to talk to her about embezzling and the fan club and all that good stuff, right? It's crazy. Once again, Abraham Quintanilla, Abraham Quintanilla asked Yolanda about the fan club, why people were saying they're not getting anything. Yolanda Saldivar had no uh, explanation. Right, right. Let me stop her here. Nikki's like, they can't even show up for your embezzlement meeting on time. No, she didn't. Uh, Brown Eyed Girl, thank you so much for the $3, love. Thank you, thank you. You are awesome. Thank you for supporting the channel. Fans will send in letters, their fan club fee. A package will be put together and will, will be sent to them. So when that, that letter came in, whoever was in charge of the fan club Look should have processed that. I was not even part of the fan club anymore. She says, she's talking about the process of the fan club. She says, whoever's in charge of that fan club does this little packet, puts, puts it together. I wasn't even in charge of the fan club anymore. I was not even president of the fan club. I was working for her as her employee. I was working for her as her employee, okay? He showed Yolanda all the checks and told her, y Yolanda, we are, I know that you're stealing money. And Yolanda had no explanation. Selena's sister, Suzette, told me that during this confrontation that Yolanda Salvar would, would talk to Mr. Quintanilla to refute the claims, but she would always be like looking over Selena for help. And Selena would just... Yolanda was looking for a lifeline and Selena wasn't throwing mm. it to her. Selena wanted her to answer those questions. And Suzette told me that was one of the first times that she thought Selena was really believing this stuff, that something was going on, because Selena had always come to her defense before. Abraham accused me of stealing from her businesses, yelling and screaming at me, money is missing. 
and 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 and, and I kept asking, show me what you're saying, show me the date, show me, and no, I've got it right here. They wouldn't let me talk. To them, I was guilty. This is they, interesting. They Hold up. Proven me that I stole a single cent from her. Okay. If I was an embezzler, like he claimed, why didn't he ever press charges on me? This is a good point. Like, why were there no charges pressed on her? And she makes that point. There was a case. It was reviewed. However, they didn't move forward with it. Doesn't mean that there weren't. Like, I my understanding is is that they decided not to move forward with it because of the fact that there was. They already charged her with murder. Why would else would they charge her with something else? That's my understanding of it. However, however, if you guys remember in 1995, Abraham Quintanilla, we reviewed that interview. And we did it here. And he showed the documents, right? Let's keep watching and then we're going to show you something else here. He didn't because he never had that evidence. All we can do is just try and be. Begins this month on Oxygen True Crime. All right. The whole story was the motive was that she was stealing, she got caught, I gotta kill Selena. Everything was planned once she was fired for embezzlement. Right now, if you ask the fans of Selena, they're going to tell you, Yolanda killed Selena because she was taking money from her. Look at that. They're saying that she embezzled from Selena's company. There's no way she embezzled from Selena's company because I worked at Selena's company. There is weeks that we didn't even have money to pay payroll. Not only was it the company, but what about the fan club? It was see, this is the part that really gets me about the series is they're only talking about one and they're not talking about the other. There were multiple things that were happening. There was Selena, et cetera, et cetera. And then there was also the fan club that the fan club, people would pay twenty two dollars to be part of this fan club and they would get sent this package. Right. Uh, people weren't receiving those packages or they weren't receiving what they paid for. They're not mentioning this in this part of that. And we didn't have money to pay payroll, not because Yolanda was stealing money or anybody was stealing money. We didn't have money to pay payroll because salaries were high. Secondly, we had no customers. Mm. How is Yolanda going to steal money from a boutique or a business that isn't even making any money or making a profit? Interesting. When I started working for her, I, I had no idea what I was walking into. I had no idea. I came to work for her, and I was doing what she asked me to do. Selena was stubborn. She said, I know what you're doing because you're showing me. We went to Nations Bank, and, and even the president of Nations Bank warned Selena, look, Selena, your, your business is so crumbling. Your, your creditors are calling me. Your payroll checks are bouncing. You don't have any money in the bank. And, and, and she would tell me, Yolanda, we have to do something to make my businesses work. This is, inter this is an interesting allegation that you could definitely find information about. Where is all this information? Like, if there's public record, there's lawsuits, or people aren't getting paid, or anything like that. I mean, what other employee besides Martin Gomez, who basically said that, that Yolanda Saldiva had a shrine, a shrine in her home of Selena, what other employees have spoken out? Anybody heard any other employees say they haven't been paid and they were working for Selena? This would have been a thing that would have been huge. They would have had to, especially if Selena was, as they say, so concerned about her image. Why wasn't this bigger news? Uh, Abraham admitted confronting Yolanda on March 9th, 95, after being told she had embezzled from the fan club. So, like, did you ever, like, get ideas of amounts of money or had you ever, like, in, in your book, I think you said 60000 And in another article, it says 90000 Let's make it ninety, then it sounds better. I would say it was several thousand. I, I it probably was in between thirty and ninety thousand dollars, and there might have been more because we. And this is the shit that really gets to me uh, with this attorney. Again, this is the district attorney that uh, was leading the case against Yolanda. This is where you know you you you're going under national, international show, public television. This is the thing that you need an answer for right away. I don't know if we weren't certain uh, we because we, we stopped reviewing the amounts because we weren't really certain of the amounts. What are you talking about? You should know, because now that's going to come into question for the folks that are reviewing this. Right. Mm. We stopped at a certain point during the investigation. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I use my the sources that I use. I'd have to go back and look at my source, but oh. everything was sourced. But again, you're dealing 
with a subject that is shrouded in legend. So it was really hard sometimes to put real figures on things like what was the amount of the embezzlement. The source is Abraham Quintanilla. We have the source. We know what he said. We never know how much money and how Yolanda took it because they were saying that Yolanda took a lot of money. Where is that money? Nobody found that. Yes, we know how much that money was. I think it's part of like the generational divide in talking about Selena is that for people like my parents and my older cousins, they remember more distinctly, oh, she was stealing tens of thousands of dollars from Selena whatever figure it was, because it was in the tabloid coverage, it was in the zeitgeist at that time. After that, it's just kind of gotten a little bit more vague. According to no. the police, the no. whole motive was that she, she, stole money. she stole money when there was nothing. There wasn't, but they needed this meeting and this motive to prosecute her. Yes. Let me stop right here, okay? This is the, the BS that I'm talking about. I'm going to show you. One second. I'm going to show you. We did this live. What was it? Four days ago. This live right here. In 1995, Abraham Quintanilla had been interviewed with Maria Celeste Herreras in Primer Impacto. At about, y'all can watch that video. It's in the playlist. At about the 37-minute mark, Abraham talks about these checks. He talks about how Yolanda was using her sister's name, Eleida Saldivar, who I believe has since passed away. I'm not really sure. But they don't really reference her there. So just kind of keep that in mind. To sign over checks. Abraham Quintanilla makes a quote. He says it's over about $6,000 of embezzlement that they know of based on the documentation that they have right there. It didn't, it wasn't 90, it wasn't 80. But if you go to the source, which is Abraham Quintanilla, he put in the amount. He said how much it was going to be. He said what it was. He said it in 1995. So why are we now in 2024 talking about? I don't know how much it is. You know how much it is? I don't, what, what you mean? Oh, I don't know. I'm the attorney in the case with the grand jury. I don't know how much it is. Do you know how much it is? It's the thing about the generation and the families fight and the Mexican, the Latinos. Get the hell out of here. Get out of here with that. We knew Abraham in 1995 said what the amount was. He said it was about $6,000 that they had calculated at that time. 37 minute timestamp. Check it out right there. Set it in primer impacto. Drives me crazy when people act like crazy like that. Anyways, let's continue, okay? She's never even been ever prosecuted for embezzlement. No. no. Mm. The prosecution it never proved in court that I was stealing anything. And even the district attorney said they never had evidence to charge me with embezzlement because I think it didn't exist. Abraham was going to carry that narrative no matter what. And there was no way, no room for me to even say what really was happening. The embezzlement investigation, it was never presented to a grand jury because it wasn't necessary in the end. During the trial, it's not really embezzlement that we need to prove. Thank you, Rem. That's exactly what I'm saying. What we need to prove is that Mr. Quintanilla thought there was embezzlement going on. We were alleging Mr. Quintanilla thought she was doing something illegal, improper, that there was money missing. And based on that, he decided to confront Yolanda Saldivar. The actual confrontation started the whole domino effect. One domino falls and another one falls and another it, that resulted in the death of Selena. The first domino at that meeting. Mm. And that goes to a gun store in San Antonio okay. and buys. This is a very important point. Let's talk about the gun store. OK, a place to shoot. That was the gun store. Now. Very conveniently, this is the piece that I, if I could have Mr. Carlos Valdez, this uh, uh, prosecutor here, I wish they would have said this. They might say it in the part two. I don't know. But Yolanda had purchased the weapon and then decides to return the weapon and then repurchase the weapon. They didn't mention that in this series. How do we know this? Because we reviewed the 1995 interview with Abraham Quintanilla where he broke that down. This is why I tell y'all, any time that a new series of, of Serena Quintanilla comes out, go back to 1995, review those interviews, because that'll tell you everything. You see, once it's out there, you can't take it back anymore. The gun. She 
she goes to a place to shoot in San Antonio and she files what's called an intent to purchase a gun. In mm. Texas, we have a three day waiting list. Comes back three days later on Monday and pays the balance of the gun. When you buy a gun, you're not gonna go deliver daisies. Why would Yolanda Saldivar need a gun? There's a reason you buy a gun. You got it for hunting, you buy it for self-defense, or you buy it to kill somebody. There you go. Why people buy guns? I went and, 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 and I bought the gun. It was after the, the March 9th meeting. I didn't feel safe. It was my own self-defense. That if anything came my way, I was gonna protect myself. I was fearful. Selena wanted her financial documents that Yolanda had access to. Yolanda had all these documents that Selena needed to prepare her income tax. Mm -mm -mm. As long as she has that information, Selena has to go through Yolanda to get it. And so Yolanda Saldivar would hold on to these records because she knew that was her link to Selena. Yolanda's world is she's with Selena. If that ends, the last thing she okay. said on earth was Yolanda Saldivar, room 158. So Selena needed to get these documents because she was going to file her taxes. Um, one thing, again, the episode doesn't address the whole repurchasing of the gun issue, which is, I think, a very important part of premeditation and intent, right? It, it throws away the accident narrative right off the window. Like, you just, it, it does. Okay? So keep that in mind. I am so sorry she's gone. I'm so sorry that it, all her family's hurting. And I'm so sorry my family has hurt. I'm sorry the fans have hurt. At no point did I meant to harm anyone. I even still remember the day it happened. Yeah. Like I was in eighth grade. Uh, kids that had radios that were listening to in class, they had heard it already on the radio. And I did just, you know it was Yolanda? No. I was at work. I'll never forget. They called me and said there was an aunt incident and your aunt and Selena were involved. Mm, 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 mm. And Selena had died. And I just... I cried all the way home. I cried to her house. I cried. It's crazy because I still remember like it was yesterday. Me too. It's crazy. It it's, like it's, it's, something, it's something that's there because it's so tragic that it, 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 it doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. Doesn't go away. Yeah. Incident. If only the tape in Abraham Quintanilla's hands could mend their hearts, torn apart apparently at the hands of Yolanda Saldivar. Notice that evil queen incident. Notice how the words that they're using. I think she knew it over there. She already had plans. When, why would she have a gun? She lured her over there. She already had plans. Why would she have a gun? Okay. We bet Yolanda going into the interview room there at the police department. So they bring her into the interrogation room. This is a very important part. I'm at, this is where another discrepancy happens in real time in 2024. She agreed to talk to us. She answered the questions that eventually became a written statement. Yolanda told me Selena met her sometime that morning to go over the, the business records from Selena's fan club. She told us that there was some type of argument over monies and that Selena was going to talk to her father, discuss it with her father, possibly get the police involved. And Yolanda mm. did not want her to leave, tried to keep her from leaving the room at first. Selena was leaving the room. That's when Yolanda said she shot as she was getting to the door. I did ask her, I said, okay, you say the gun went off. Now, Yolanda, I don't think it was an accident. You shot her. You meant to shoot her. And in Spanish, it came out, fue de coraje. It was out of anger, rage. I'll always remember she told me she shot her in anger. Shot her in anger. Okay. Now, back in 1995, apparently, they didn't record interrogations, which I don't understand what the hell that's all about. Like, they had just gotten done. America, we had just gotten done with the O.J. Simpson trial. For there to be room for error in trials is just ridiculous. But this, this interrogation wasn't recorded um and i'm not talking about video recording i'm just talking about in general recorded like with a tape recorder what she said is what she said they have the confession and for them yolanda kills Selena. we have the proof and that's it um what do you know about the confession what's the what's the story behind the confession the story behind the confession is that uh police work is awfully funky when you just don't record a confession straight on, but you transcribe and write down notes, and we never hear the full audio of what actually went on. That methodology leaves so much room for interpretation. When they got me in the interrogating room, uh, Party Vedam was upset and he said, 
I've been out here since this morning, I and mean, it's almost midnight. I need for you to tell me what happened. We're hungry, and we need to get going. Look at this. He was Look at this. To intimidate me, and he says, "You, you went to that hotel to kill her. You went to, no, no. I was, I was in the hotel. I was asleep." The detectives tell her, "You went, or the officers, you went in that hotel to kill her." Yolanda says, "No, I was in the hotel and I was asleep." Hold up, hold up. I thought that she had called Selena because allegedly she's alleging rape and that she was bleeding out and she needed Selena to take her to the hospital. And that's what was going on. This is in real time, 2024. What happened? That's what, mm, that's what she said. She said, that's what, but there was medical staff that, went to the trial and testified where she neglected to get any medical treatment. So now she's saying in here that Selena went to the hotel. She was asleep. So Selena just showed up to the hotel and said, hey, what's up? I'm just here. What? She called her to come over. She needed to go to the hospital. Yeah. I didn't go to the crime scene. She came at eight o'clock in the morning to my room. And I, 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 was, I was telling him all this and he was writing. I was there telling him, well, no, no, you, you, you're writing that wrong because it didn't happen like that. And he said, no, no, this is what happened because we have evidence. And so he said, okay, I need to- Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, Nikki called her twice. So this is her new, this is more contradiction, more contradicting information. This is in in 2024. This is the new docu series. This is what she's saying. So was she asleep or was she not asleep? Did she call her twice? Did she not call her twice? Was she raped or was she not raped? Notice how conveniently they're not even mentioning the rape in this new series. They're also not mentioning the fact that she told people that Abraham had raped her. Are they going to correct that in part two? Mm. Did you know the gun went off? Yes, it, it, I heard it. I heard it go off. And, and how it did you startled react? me. It startled her. It startled me. I did not know when my gun went off. I did not know that it hit her because I thought that she just ran. Like it, it scared me, it scared her. All I can say is that there was never, ever any intention to do her any harm. Look at this. When Yolanda says, it went off without me really trying to. I honestly believe her. I've never had any doubt in her. Like, for it to have been intentional, never. Yolanda Salvador wasn't pointing a glass of water at her. She she was pointing a gun, you know? So she was. If, if you knew that something was going to happen by pointing a gun at somebody. Also, we knew what had happened before and after she shot Selena. And we knew what Yolanda Salvador had done right there at the scene. The fact that you'd call your best friend a bitch, okay, under any circumstances, right? Especially under such horrible circumstances as shooting them, to me, indicative of what's in her mind. Yolanda called Selena a bitch, but she didn't. So there was a witness, and I've said it before, there was one witness who failed. Okay, only one person heard her say bitch as she's shooting up the gun, okay? She's leaving that room. The woman that heard her, one of the maids of the hotel room didn't even tell the police till later on. It didn't happen right away. So people have since discredited the whole bitch thing. But there was more than one person that saw her walk out of the room with the gun still in hand. You see, when you accidentally shoot somebody, why would you just keep holding on to the gun? Why not drop it? And if you're a nurse, why wouldn't you render aid to your friend? Especially if you called your friend and told her that you had been raped and she's out here taking you to the hospital to render aid to you. Like, which one is it, Linda? Yolanda? Really, which one is it, Yolanda? That's your name. I should have said that. Not tell police this the day of the murder. Mm. There was other maids and other hotel employees at the scene who have questioned if this lady was even telling the truth. Yolanda calling Selena bitch did not quite fit neatly into the puzzle that the prosecution had constructed. 
There was another piece of the puzzle that didn't quite fit, and Yolanda's defenders believe completely flips the narrative. Interesting. A few days after the murder, a maid cleaning out the room found an item in the safe at the okay. hotel room. And as far as... This is an interesting part, but it's not new. Not new information, even though they made it sound like it was new. A couple days after the murder, there was uh, hotel maids uh, that were cleaning the room, okay? There's a safe in the room, and apparently in the safe was a bag that was inside, inside the safe. And it was a bag that belonged to Yolanda, okay? Yolanda's defenders are concerned. This element really changes the whole storyline. Tell me the story about the purse. Once the room was released, and, and by release, I mean no, no longer part of the crime scene, staff from the hotel came to inventory the room. The, the purse was found inside the safe. Right. Mm-hmm. I then contacted Rose Gonzalez here, the assistant manager, recovered that purse from her, inventory the contents of the purse. I mean, purse in the safe? Like, was it anything significant to you? No. No. Identification inside the purse showed that the purse belonged to Yolanda Salivar. This is Ray Rivera's listing off the contents of Yolanda's purse. The following were inside the purse, a prescription bottle for Xanax pills. She was taking Xanax. Xanax pills. For what exactly? Pills for Yolanda Salivar. Her nurse card, the letter from the attorney. A letter from a... A letter from an attorney. Richard Garza had an attorney. What's that? What was the letter? I don't recall. Don't recall what? The letter itself. So here's the detective. Well, what was the letter? I don't recall what the letter was. Mark, any idea? Was oh, that the resignation letter? I don't remember anything about the resignation letter. Tell me about the resignation letter. The resignation letter from... From... I, whose resignation letter? Then? Come on, Carlos. Th there was a resignation letter from Yolanda. There was a resignation letter in the purse that was found in the safe. Carlos. <laughs> I I remember something like that. I, I yeah, there was a resignation letter. I think it was written by her lawyer. He, and that's a great question. How did they miss this? That is an and that's the piece that I'm like either shitty police work. They didn't check every portion of the room. Let me tell you something. One thing I learned. I have a bachelor's in criminology, and there was a detective or a former detective that was a professor of mine, and he said in a murder scene, in a crime scene. The walls can talk, right? The walls can talk. They could tell you what happened if you pay attention. I would have given anything to have been in that room to understand exactly what happened, how they missed that piece in 1995. And then they found it a couple days later, a resignation letter from an attorney, okay? It looks like a draft of a letter that was dated March 13th, which was a couple of weeks before the, the shooting. Mm, let me see what these are. This was her resignation letter to mm -hmm. Selena on March the 13th. And so it says, it is with great regret and reservation that Miss Yolanda Saldivar submits her employment resignation from your company, Selena, etc. She was resigning, but it was formatted via letter from a, a lawyer, but didn't mean their friendship was over there. She right. was just walking away from the business. Why did Yolanda need uh, an attorney for a resignation letter? Maybe it's a different time, but I mean, nowadays, don't you just need like a two week notice or a month notice? So she used an attorney for a resignation letter. Yolanda did. And it's it's it, this letter wasn't signed by the attorney, by the way. The other thing that's really interesting about this letter is that at the beginning, it says the reason for her resignation isn't that Yolanda didn't like working for Selena. It's because state it really clearly on this letter the day-to-day -day dealings with certain members of your family has made it impossible for miss saldivar to work for you or selena etc certain members of your family have made it impossible for me to work with the company and so this just goes back to what's the story that we've always heard yolanda was fired Correct. by selena and abraham quintanilla but this is her resignation letter to them. Correct. Yeah. Yolanda was never Ooh. fired. And that's another thing that the that the public doesn't understand. Like after that March 9th meeting, Yolanda's really trying to put distance between her and Selena. 
let me stop right there. Abraham Quintanilla said in an interview that she had been fired or removed from the businesses in Corpus Christi, but that Selena, they decided to keep her in the businesses in Monterrey, Mexico. So she wasn't technically fired. She was placed over there in those businesses. They were trying to get her away from all the businesses in Corpus because of the mess, the financial mess that they were finding out she had caused. So Selena was keeping her in Monterrey, Mexico, while they were trying to figure out what's up with this, who's going to drive the business over here. Okay, so keep that in mind. This should have been something that talked about over and over oh, in, yes. her, in her trial. Yes, they yes. knew. Yes. They knew she resigned. Yeah. It's crazy. They knew. They knew she resigned. Look what she pulls next. It's not signed by the lawyer, so I don't even know if this was ever sent. Did Selena ever get this letter? Not to that moment. I don't know if it was sent or not. I don't remember. Oh, this is interesting too. So they say that this was like this was never sent, but I'm looking at a police statement that Chris, Selena's husband, made on April the 5th. And in his statement, he says, Yolanda went to an attorney and the attorney, whose name I do not remember, sent some kind of letter to Selena. I remember Selena talking to Yolanda mm -hmm. on the phone about the letter which she got from the attorney. Selena felt betrayed by Yolanda. Yolanda stayed on the payroll, but would not come around to the boutique in Corpus. Isn't that what we just said? See, Tina pulled out the smoking gun, right? She's like, ooh, but get this. Here's a statement, a police statement from Chris. That's not new news, that's pretty old. I could pull the link to that too, hold up. So the DA or whatever, right? Even though they're saying that she didn't get this letter yeah. or they're discrediting that it was said it. chris is actually saying, saying that she got it she got it yeah mm -hmm. and she felt betrayed this is crazy it's crazy it took corpus christi police three days to figure out that yolanda's purse was in the safe of the hotel let me stop right there this is what i'm referencing so there is a website by the name of selena forever and in this website, this is like a fan base website. They have all the articles from the Houston Chronicles from 1995. And in here, this specific article outlines Chris' uh, um, acknowledgement of the letter, that statement right there, because what they're saying is that the police ignored the theory that, and the DA ignored the theory that Yolanda tried to commit suicide, which the way in which this docuseries is going, I'm pretty sure that's where they're going to take it to. They're going to say that Yolanda got the gun, purchased purchased it once, repurchased it again, decided to commit suicide in front of Selena. That was her attempt, and then the gun went off. Accidentally, didn't mean to, that kind of thing. So in this article specifically, it says right here that the letter contradicts testimony by Selena's widower, Chris Perez who told jurors last week that Saldivar had been fired by Selena, but was kept around so they could collect missing business records from her. The letter was written four days after Selena, her father and manager, Abraham Quintanilla Jr., and sister Suzette, confronted Saldivar at the family recording studio Q Productions, asking her about money they believe was missing from the singer's business. It was also written the same day Yolanda Saldivar picked up the 38 revolver from a San Antonio gun shop. The state plans to wrap its case today. So this very old article. But what she's pulling out, this rabbit out of the hat, the smoking gun, it's not new. It's been known. It's been out there. Okay? So it's just everybody's aware. Not new. Not new information. All right? Let's keep reviewing. Let's keep going. We're almost done here. That there was a resignation letter. And then it just boggles my mind that once they found it, that they just dismissed it. It's confusing behavior. And I don't know why would a cop who finds this resignation letter in the safe in Yolanda's hotel room not introduce mm. it, investigate it, pursue further lines of questioning about it? That's a good point, right? If y'all found this evidence, why not keep investigating? Would it have changed everything? Would it have given a different motive of the murder? Would it have supported an accident theory? I don't know. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. You know, that's 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 something that really bothers me. And 
again, these are just clips, just so everybody's aware. I, I think that March 9th meeting really made some impression with Yolanda. Something scared her that um, shortly after that, on the 11th, uh, my grandpa and my cousins go down to Corpus Christi with the with the trailer and and bring all of her stuff back to San Antonio. Completely moves out of her apartment. What I want to know is that, so one of the things that they found in her purse, thank you, Susie. Uh, one of the things that they found in her purse, in that purse that was in the safe, they found a bottle of Xanax that was prescribed to Yolanda. I'd like to understand what her state of mind for her to have taken Xanax. Um, it sounds like based on what the Saldivar family is saying is that they were pulling all of Yolanda's um, belongings from where she used to live back and they were you know she was going to come back to where she was at initially uh you know to leave this whole fan club stuff behind i guess i don't really know oh this is the tape that was in yolanda's answering machine because she still had the lease to the end of the month she left her answering machine there and people left messages that's here That is her orientation for the job that she got. So in her voicemail, in Yolanda's voicemails, uh, they found that she was having, like, uh, employers were calling her, letting her know when, when orientation was going to be for a future job. The family is trying to say here that essentially Yolanda wanted to resign, supports the resignation letter, wanted to leave the whole fan club and Selena stuff alone and wanted to move on with their life. She wanted to get a job. This is what the family is saying. Now, I don't know. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. But again, they're not showing dates of these voice recordings. They're not showing like there should be a date on this, but there is. isn't. These are just recordings that they're pulling out of tape. We should be able to tell when these were actually recorded. This is an orientation. So Yolanda was moving <laughs> on. on. She was moving on. So where is the, I'm going to kill you because you're firing me, when somebody left her a message on her machine about starting a and nursing you, job yeah. all over again? Yeah. And that's a good question. If Yolanda really wanted to resign, then why are you holding on to financial records? Why, like, why not leave on the 9th? I get it. Selena wasn't accepting it. Okay, well, I'm sorry. If I am a lot older than Selena, okay, I'm sorry, Selena. We could be friends, but I need some distance. I'm out of here. This is your business. I got confronted and I was accused of embezzlement. I don't need to be in here. I'm not going to be around this whole situation. I'm out of here. She didn't have to stay there, but she stayed. Help me understand that. How does that work? Thank you, uh, Luna, for pointing that out. Yolanda had already started making plans to go back to her nursing career. Yep. Yolanda had already been going to interviews. She already had uh, a job offered to her. That doesn't seem like somebody who is trying to do everything she can to stay in Selena's inner circle or keep her job with Selena. In addition to the message from, from that new employer. Ooh, now listen to this, okay? Selena was also trying to talk to Yolanda, something that the public hasn't heard before. Yolanda, it's me, Selena. I'm home. I called you a little bit early, but I didn't leave a message. We, oh, there's one date right there. Um, can you give me a call? Back on? March 10th. That's me. Flight's leaving at 2 10. We changed it. Um, all right, catching up there. Hello, Yolanda, it's me, Selena. I was calling to find out everything was. I'm coming home tomorrow early in the morning. It's me, Selena. I guess you're not home. Calling you from the plane. You know how expensive this is? You should be home. I'll take this call. All right. Guess you're going to have to me when I get home. I'll see you later, Buffy. Bye. I'll tell you when I get to Miami. I'll see you later, bestie. Buffy. Bye. You know, typically voice recordings, isn't there like something that says March 13th at 5 p.m.? Beep. And then there's a voicemail. I mean, they're not showing that. I'm not saying that. The information is wrong. I just wanted more receipts when it came to this piece, because if what that says to me is, let's just say, let's just play devil's advocate for a little, just a little bit. Let's be devil's advocate. Let's sleep just for a second. Entertain me, entertain me. Let's just say that Yolanda really wanted to quit 
and Selena didn't want her to leave, right? And leaves her all these voicemails. Did she have to reciprocate? No, she could have just ignored. She could have moved on. She could have said, you know what? Your dad's a your dad's a wacko. I'm out of here. I, I'm afraid for my life. I'm fearful. I'm, ha- I'm thinking about buying a gun. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah, no. What do these voicemails actually tell us anyways at the end of the day? Does it paint a different narrative about the obsessed fan situation? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Okay. And she was my friend. Like that that's my friend too, you know. Mm. And she still calling Yoli and it just reminds me of like, how okay. we used to be, like, you know, nothing like they say. And, you know, that's after the March 9th. We know that it's like that Selena was just part of Yolanda's mm-hmm. life. And the reason I'm crying is because it's so heartbreaking that Abraham and everybody say that it's just that they weren't close. Yeah. Like, I mean, you're hearing Selena calling her and calling her and calling her, right? Selena isn't, I want nothing to do with you. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, and yeah. that's and that's what that's always been betrayed. Yeah. Uh, if you knew this person was stealing, you knew they were bad, you knew your family didn't want this, this person in your life, why would you continue? She's not scared like it, there's no fear there's, there's no fear there it's almost mm. like hey where are you yeah, where, where are you? you like i need you she was trying to keep that friendship yeah but people were trying to pull them apart from each other but people were trying to pull them apart each other really but i thought yolanda was like i wanted to leave resign nursing job selena and yolanda were close they, they were like sisters all right, so then the people, more people are interviewed and they support that Selena, Yolanda, or like sisters. Let me keep watching. Let's watch. What is this? Uh, this receipts and documents from a place to shoot. This is where she bought the gun. It doesn't make sense that she would have just gone and bought a gun. No. Out of the, that, out, out of the blue. Out of the blue, no. Yeah. What doesn't make sense is when she bought it, returned it, and then bought it again. That's what doesn't make sense to me. And what doesn't make sense that if Yolanda was so in fear of her life, why didn't she file any police reports? She alleged, and I'm pretty sure this is going to be in part two, she alleged that her her tires were slashed. She alleged that she was being stopped, that people were cutting her brakes. Are there any police reports out there that would substantiate her allegations at this point? I don't know. I mean, maybe there is. I don't know. I don't think so. Which just shows you that something scared her. It wasn't just about embezzlement. There was something else going on. There was. There was. She was taking Xanax too, so she was trying to calm. I'm assuming it's for calming her nerves and you know helping her and everything. Maybe, maybe there was something. Maybe she was at a breaking point. Yes. Something, something vengeful, something hateful. Something. There was a point, probably about mm. three quarters of the way through the seven and a half hours, where Yolanda wanted to talk about a lot of things. Then she started talking about how she was afraid. They, they threatening me. They killed me. This is my friend's father. What she's saying is, I was f- afraid. Of- there you go. Okay. So. She basically says, I'm afraid of my friend's father, all this other stuff. And that's essentially where it leads on. That's the last clip, but that's, you know, um, where they keep going and essentially lead on to part two, which part two is tonight. There was no restraining orders. There was no police report that said that she was afraid of her life. There was nothing. There was, if anything, there was enough information out there to say that she was a calculated kind of person. I'm sorry. It just is. I would have given her the benefit of the doubt. I mean, go back to the articles in 1995. This one's specific. This one's called the, and I go back to the local reporters. Um, the queen is dead. This is 1995. Okay. Out of Texas monthly. All right. And if you go to, this is, um, somebody wrote in here that says the killer and, and, they essentially describe Yolanda's obsessiveness drove him to quit. 
So Martin Gomez, who was the other person who discussed the fact that Yolanda was just so obsessed with Selena, he had to quit. He couldn't even be there, right? He substantiated a lot of the information that was going on, a lot of the, the conflicts that he saw felt like were driven by Yolanda. It was said she was a loner who had lived with their mother until recently had new friends. She had once been accused of embezzling funds from a previous employer. We talked about that and had uh, defaulted on student loans. A woman who moved into an apartment with Yolanda discovered that Yolanda didn't just have pictures of Selena on her walls. The whole place was like a shrine. So it spooked the woman and moved out after two weeks. OK, and then. Additionally, the narrative of how much was embezzled, Abraham Quintanilla said it himself. Abraham Quintanilla said it himself how much the amount was, okay? He showed us those checks. This was clearly before she died. It was like a couple weeks before the murder, but these were the checks. These were what they were confronting Yolanda with. Preguntamos a Yolanda, Yolanda, ¿por qué empezaste tú eh, la cuenta del fan club, de los club de fanáticos? Bajo el nombre de tu hermana María Elida Saldiva. Yolanda, why did you uh, uh, sign on the fan club checks under your sister's name, María Judá Saldiva? Why doesn't the docuseries answer that part? They gloss right over the embezzlement allegations. They didn't charge her with embezzlement, therefore it didn't happen. Okay, why doesn't... Why didn't they talk about the fact that they have these checks and their the signature looked very interesting? Are they not able to talk about that? Cuando ella ni siquiera era miembro del club. When she wasn't even a member of the of the club. ¿Por qué no dejaste que la tesorera se encargara de eso? Why didn't you let the treasurer handle that? Mm. ¿Y cuál es What was her response? Esta de ella es Señor Quintanilla, es que el banco no me permitió abrir eh, una cuenta eh, sobre el nombre de la TV. Her response was, Señor Quintanilla, uh, it's just that the bank didn't let me open uh, an account under my name. All right, so I'm going to stop right there. Feel free to watch all those videos. It's in a playlist. Those are all translated. The very first interviews in 1995 are very important because you will notice that some of this information has already been told before. There's some parts that I'm like, I didn't know this. Maybe the fact that there was more relatives working in the company that I didn't know about. Um, and then also the Selena voice recordings, that's pretty new. That's new, new. Uh, but I guess we'll see. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. If you like this review, please hit the like button because we're going to be reviewing part two tomorrow because part two airs tonight. Make sure you watch it if you can. There's a free app called Fobu, fobu.com, where you can get like a like a trial for like a week and you can watch it there uh, if that's what you want to do. Or if you just want to wait for my review, then we will see you guys tomorrow. I will see you guys on the next one. I got to head out. Have a good one, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>